Today I'm going to be talking about uh, unpacking, uh, semi-automatic unpacking. I'm not talking about guns here. I'm actually talking about unpacking of uh, executables, uh, specifically Windows executables, because we're talking about using Ollie Debug here. Ollie Bone is a plugin that I wrote for Ollie Debug, so uh, it could be applied in other ways. But here's the uh, the proof of concept I've got for it. So to get started. Uh, the problem that I have in my job uh, as a reverse engineer, I have to look at malware all day long, and it's, it's packed pretty much 95% of the time. Uh, and you know how many packers there are out there. There's just a ton of them, uh, all different versions of them, and they all work slightly differently. Uh, and so what ends up happening is I've got to learn the ins and out you know, of a dozen or, or so packers that might be used every single day. And it's kind of boring, you know. Once you've done it and and learned, you know exactly well, where to set your breakpoints and and how to go about unpacking a particular packer, uh, you know, it becomes just a tedious thing at that point. And really, I don't want to spend my time messing around with the the packers. I want to get you know inside the malware and find out uh, what it is that it's doing. And so, you know, the packer is just kind of a, a you know annoyance. Uh, so. I thought I'd just kind of sum up first uh, how people are approaching this problem right now, uh, other than me. Um, you know, reverse engineering is, you know, about as hard as you can get as far as, you know, the approaches you can take here, doing it manually. And, you know, that's what I end up doing because actually I'd rather spend my time looking at a debugger than going out and trying to see if I can download something that will automatically unpack uh, the, ma the malware that I'm looking at. Uh, so. If we're going to go through all this trouble of, of learning how to reverse engineer this particular packer, well, then we might as well just write an unpacking engine for it, so you know, to save us some time later on. So that's what a lot of people have done. They've written these these unpacking engines uh, that you know are, are tailored to not only usually the packer but a specific version of the packer. So as somebody releases a new packer version, you've got to get the latest unpacker version. Uh, and so this, this is uh, taking up a lot of time uh, if you're into this kind of thing too. Like the antivirus companies, they have to do this uh, if they want to be able to scan the malware and, and detect if they have a signature that already matches it. Uh, because anybody can take the same malware and pack it you know, a dozen different ways and if the antivirus company doesn't have all of those packers and, and a way to work around them, then they're not going to detect it uh, the other ways it's packed. Uh, but if they go down this route and they, they write an unpacking engine for uh, each, uh, you know, packer that's out there, what happens is your, your scanner, you can, as you can imagine, is going to get pretty bloated after a while. I mean, you've got to put a lot of code in there to deal with all these uh, specific variants of packers. Uh, so unfortunately, what I think a lot of the antivirus companies do is, is just don't bother. And it's kind of scary to me uh, how often I see new malware come out and, you know, it's, it's the same old thing. It might be an Arabot or Agabot, something that we've seen over and over again. But, you know, it's, a, it's been newly compiled, newly packed, and, you know, most of the antivirus companies don't detect it until they get a copy of it and, and actually uh, write a signature. Uh, the other way, or one of the other ways, I guess, you can uh, approach the problem is to emulate. Uh, that is, you know, write your own virtual CPU instruction uh, decoder and, uh, you know, your own executable loader that will uh, pick up the executable, parse it, uh, and then start executing your emulation engine to, you know, unpack the code gradually. So in this way, uh, if you're good enough at emulating the, uh, the CPU, usually x86, um, then you don't really have to deal with uh, specifics of that particular packer's algorithms. You don't really care. You're just going to emulate it just like the CPU would. Uh, but you know, writing these things is, is pretty hard. You know, I'm not smart enough to write one. Uh, so the people that do end up writing these end up, you know, either being uh, the, the corporate, the antivirus companies, or somebody that's put a lot of time and effort into it. And so they generally don't give these away for free. Um, there may be some exceptions, um, but. Again, you also have to be very careful about, you know, a accurately emulating that CPU because if you, you know, mess up one instruction and you, you know, load a register wrong, then something's going to go terribly wrong with that program and it's not going to unpack. So you've got to get it right. Um, another way is kind of a shortcut. Uh, you know, if you have no other way to get around something and you just have no other time, it's not a bad way uh, for approaching malware anyway. Um, basically, you just take a... Uh, 
like a virtual machine perhaps in VMware, you uh, just run the code. While it's in memory, you just dump that, uh, that virtual or physical memory. And then uh, you've got an image of the code after the unpacking part ran, and you've got basically the unpacked code. Now, it's pretty messed up in terms of you know, where the PE headers are, are aligned and uh, the, uh, the import table is going to be all screwed up. Uh, but you know, you've got the code. You could probably load it into IDA and, and, and look at it. And so that's what a lot of people can do. The problem is that uh, you don't have that code in the same condition that it was uh, when it was first run or, or in an unpacked state. What happens is you've got all these variables that are initialized or uninitialized when the code starts. And then as your program runs, these variables in memory get filled with other values. And so now you've dumped this memory position with those values in it. And so you're running it in, in a completely uh, you know, unknown state, really. Uh, and you've also got to figure out where the start of the code is, what we call the uh, original entry point, the OEP. You've got to find that in the code. Now, a lot of compilers it's pretty easy to spot where that OEP is because uh, they use a, a very specific uh, prologue, prologue to, uh, to starting up the actual code in main. Uh, but if somebody perhaps just wrote it in assembly, just, uh, you know, just a raw image that they put together, you, know, you may not be able to tell right away. You might have to do some uh, sophisticated tracing to, to figure that out. So uh, all in all, it's a good solution if you just maybe want to unpack something and see what the strings are. Uh, in inside it, but in terms of running it and debugging it, uh, it's not really a good option. So I thought about, you know, what is it that, that most of the packers have in common? And everyone that I looked at, or, or pretty much most of them that I looked at, work basically the same way. What they'll do is they will go through each section of code, they'll pack it, encrypt it, compress it somehow, and then they'll append a, a stub section at the end, which has their special unpacking code. Then they'll go to the PE header, they'll edit the uh, entry point to now point to their stub code. And then uh, when you start that executable, the stub code will run, and then it'll do its unpacking. And then after it's done unpacking, it will jump to the original entry point, the OEP, and begin running. And a lot of times that just happens to be the first section. Uh, here's a diagram, uh, pretty much uh, just kind of shows you the difference, you know, what something looks like uh, in the code sections of an unpacked and a packed executable. And you can see in the, on the pack side uh, they, that you see a, a stub section at the end that's been added. And then that's where the entry point is. And then after it runs, we jump to that original entry point in the first section. So a lot of them work like this. So working with Ollie Debug, a lot of times I just sat there and said, you know, if I could just set a breakpoint right there on that first section of code, you know, matter, no matter where in that code, uh, you know, it's running, if it would just break when it hit that one section, uh, then all I'd have to do is just run the code, and, and it would break right there, and I'd be at the original entry point, and I'd be good to go. It'd be unpacked. Uh, and in a way, you can kind of do this already. Ollie Debug lets you set a breakpoint on access for a particular section in memory. Uh, the problem with using the break on access in this way is that your stub code now is going to, before it's going to run this, this uh, code section that it's unpacking, it's got to read and write from it probably uh, thousands or you know, how many ever uh, instructions there are in that code. So there's a lot of times that this break on access is just going to break because it was a read access or it was a, it was a write access. Uh, so what ends up happening here is that you're just going to go really, really slow until you figure out whether you're actually reading, writing, or you're executing. Because uh, the way that the x86 architecture is designed, you really don't have a way to tell uh, built in between the difference between a read uh, access and an execute access. And so if you're going to have to do this, you might as well just use tracing. Tracing has been around for a long time. Um, the problem with tracing is that, okay, you say, well, all right, I want this code to uh, stop whenever I'm in between this address and this address and I'm executing. So tracing is going to single step through it and just keep checking, am I at this address yet? Am I at this address yet? And just keep single stepping through. And it makes the code really, really slow in unpacking. And depending on how they packed it, uh, it could be uh, 
too slow you know, to even be practical uh, in terms of what we're talking about, you know, trying to unpack things fast for malware analysis. Now, if you're just trying to crack a program because you don't want to uh, buy the serial number, then it may not matter to you to spend two or three days tracing it. But for what we want to do, tra tracing is not really an option most of the time. And another problem with tracing is that you can detect it pretty easily because the program, uh, and, and several packers do this already, they will check to see how long it's taking to run. They can check to see how many CPU cycles have passed, and if it's taking too long, they can say, oh, I'm being traced, and just you know, change the, the path of execution or just quit. So what I said, I wish I had a way just to break on the execution only of a, of a particular section of memory without tracing, without hitting read access or write access. So what I came up with, I call Ollie Bone. Uh, break on execute is uh, the bone part. Uh, and this basically is a proofable concept that implements this type of uh, you know, break on execute uh, thing that I've been wanting. So the way we do this, uh, you know, getting around this uh, x86 uh, architecture limitation, uh, we borrow some ideas from the PAX project. Now, uh, instead of doing what the PAX project does is, you know, it's designed to protect your stack uh, from being executed, you know, in case of an overflow or your heap. Uh, but we're just going to uh, tell it uh, to protect an arbitrary page of memory or more than one pages of memory that comprise the section that we're targeting here. So a little bit of a review here. This is actually the page exec feature of PAX, there's more than just uh, that one feature. Um, but basically it works because the uh, CPU has something called uh, translation look aside buffers. And what it does is when you go to tell the, C the CPU that you need to read or execute a particular uh, address in memory, it has to do a virtual address to physical address translation to figure out where in the physical memory to go to get that piece of memory that you're asking for. And this is done using a, a page table walk and it's kind of slow. So what the uh, translation look aside buffer does is it saves that translation so the next time you go to look for that address it's already cached for you and it makes it uh, much, much faster. And the great thing about the way it was implemented is that they put in a separate uh, look aside buffer for your read and your write access than your execution access. So what we're able to do, and this is how the page exec feature works, is that you can cache the read access. And so the next time that it goes to read the page, it just proceeds as normal. But then when it goes to execute and it, try, it looks in the cache and that execute uh, translation is not there, then it has to do a page fault. And what happens with PAX is it takes over the page fault handler and then says, you know, let's find out where this page is. Oh, it's, you know, this, somebody's trying to execute the stack. We're going to kill this process. And so basically it has a uh, way of marking these pages. There's uh, the page table entry uh, for each uh, page has a uh, different bits that have different meanings. There's a user supervisor bit in there and PAX overloads that to actually mean whether something is uh, page protected or not. Uh, so we can do the same thing basically. Um, instead though of you know, protecting our stack and our heap, all we care about is that these pages of physical memory that belong to the process that we want to unpack uh, these are what we're going to actually tell our, you know, page protection. This is what we want you to prevent people from executing. Uh, and the other difference is instead of like PAX killing the process, like it's, you know, something uh, evil, what we're going to do is we're going to immediately tell the page fault handler to bail out and jump to the int1 handler for us. And what that lets us do is immediately return control back to Ollie Debug. So what happens is in Ollie Debug, it just throws up a single step break and the program stops. Ollie Debug is right there and you're hopefully at the original entry point. So the way that this is uh, implemented for Ollie Bone, uh, there is a uh, DLL, which is a plugin to Ollie Debug. Uh, and then there is a kernel driver. Uh, and this kernel driver's job is just to implement this PAX-like page protection 
uh, for uh, anything that we tell it to. Um, all we need to do now in our plugin is send an IO control and just tell it, you know, these are the sections that we're interested in, and it will then apply that protection to them. So, because it's implemented like this, and it's a, uh, you know, kind of a split architecture, you could conceivably uh, write an IDA Pro uh, plugin that would do basically the same thing using the same uh, kernel module. If you're into IDA Pro, you could definitely uh, port this over to that if anybody was wondering that. All right, so basically uh, a walkthrough of how uh, this might work in real life here. Um, for our data access, the first thing that's going to happen uh, when we're unpacking our program uh, is we're going to try to read or write from our target section. Uh, so the CPU looks and sees that it doesn't have anything in its cache already for that virtual address, so it's going to do a page table walk. Uh, and it's going to basically generate a page fault. Um, this is where we come in with our uh, Ollibone uh, Sys um, kernel module. So our page fault handler takes over for the, the Windows page fault handler and just says, okay, we're going to see now if this page fault is due to our code running or if this is just a normal page fault. Now, if it's just a normal page fault for some other reason, it'll pass it down to the system page fault handler. Uh, otherwise, what it'll do is it will toggle that bit that we marked to say that this uh, page is protected. So now that page is unprotected. And then it will read from that page. And what that does is once you read, it automatically caches in our look aside buffer uh, that uh, translation. And so then it'll now reset that uh, page table entry bit back to say that it's protected. And so now we've cached a read entry. Uh, the only thing that's not cached now is an execute access. So what happens then? Our unpacking program is now done reading and writing. It's using that cached entry for these pages and, and proceeding on its way. Uh, and now finds that it's time to execute. We're at the, uh, hopefully, at the original entry point. So. Once again, we get a page fault because it's uh, not in the cache. Uh, so it checks to see, is this due to Ollibone? Uh, if so, what it will do immediately, basically, is just pop one extra argument off the stack because the int1 handler doesn't have that uh, extra argument and jumps right to it and dumps us out where we want to be. So some problems that we've run into basically uh, using this is that uh, you know, virtual machines and emulators don't always perfectly uh, emulate the x86 uh, translation look aside buffers. Now, VMware works great, uh, it's pretty solid. Um, if you get to something like uh, Box and QEMU, they're actually emulating. And what they've done, I've looked at the source code, they've actually implemented a single translation look aside buffer. So they basically, you know, ruined our whole idea of of having these split buffers that we can, you know, leave one cached and, and use the other one as our uh, protection mechanism. Uh, so theoretically, they could work if they were just to implement split TLBs. Uh, so right now, uh, as far as I know, there's, there's no way that this would work on Box or QMU. Um, also, I imagine this means that PACs wouldn't work there uh, with the page exec protection at least. Uh, and then Microsoft Virtual PC, I have not tried. If anybody has it and, and wants to throw Ali Bone in there and see how it works, I'd be interested to hear from you. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, all you have to do is load in your executable and Ali debug like you always would. Uh, the next thing is you have to do a little bit of uh, guesswork and try to figure out what part of this executable is the final unpacked code section? What is it going to be when it's actually running unpacked? Uh, like I said, it's usually the first section after the PE header, but not always. Uh, so now all you do is locate uh, that in the memory map, and you toggle the break on execute flag that's been added to the Ali debug menu by Ali, Bo by Ali Bone. Uh, run the program. Uh, then 
when you hit an int one, all you have to do is uh, basically watch it come up and stop uh, and decide for yourself whether it's unpacked or not, really. I mean, you know, Ollie Bone doesn't really have a way to know whether it's unpacked or not. You've got to be able to determine that uh, from experience, basically. Uh, so I've got a uh, video demo here of uh, some various uh, packers uh, being unpacked. See if we can't kill this here. Try to blow this up here a little bit so people can actually read it. I don't know how well you'll be able to actually see this in the back, but hope you can see something. All right, our first uh, executable we're going to unpack here uh, is pack with FSG. Uh, and if you've ever unpacked FSG, uh, you probably know that it's ridiculously easy to manually unpack. But you know, just to show you how it works, uh, we'll go through here. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look at the memory map in, in Ollie debug. And this uh, lar FSG, uh, these are the three sections that belong to our executable process. Uh, so we've got our PE header, first section, section second section is code, and then we've got our uh, SFX import section. So we're going to highlight that uh, code section there and set our break on execute toggle. So now we do is just hit play and run the program and immediately we come to the break on execute. It's telling us that it's uh, stopped. Uh, so run our analyze code and we can see here that we can now read uh, the unpacked binary. This is uh, Peter Benaya's uh, collection he loaned to me for the purpose of this demonstration. So I appreciate that. Uh, but basically this is unpacked now. It was that easy. So let's do another one. All right, so uh, UPAC, also kind of similar to FSG, pretty easy to unpack in uh, this particular version. So we look at our memory map there again. Uh, there's our code section, and you know, since we've looked at UPAC before, we know that's where you know, we want to be when it's uh, all over with. Set our break on execute, hit play, and we've got a break on execute run our analysis and see what it looks like. And yes, it's unpacked. Let's do another one now that's a little harder. All right, uh, this is our demonstration of unpacking uh, AS protect. Is it, is it AS protect or AS protect? Does anybody know? Okay, uh, whatever it is, it sounds a, a heck of a lot better than AS pack, so. Um, so we'll go here, we've loaded it in. Uh, now if you'll notice here, there's something uh, that we have to observe that we are actually stopped uh, and in the code section itself. So instead of being in a stub section to start our execution, we're actually uh, in that code segment. So obviously we can't set a, a break on execute because we need to run it far enough to, uh, to uh, Unpack, and if we just you know start our break on execute now, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to spin our wheels. Uh, so what I did there is just uh, step through uh, the first four instructions, and basically that now jumps to another section. So that's good. We're out of that code section now. Now we can go back uh, to our memory map uh, since we're out of that section, and we can set our break on execute there. So we'll run it. And uh-oh, it detected that we are running a debugger and is now giving us a warning message and saying, uh, you can't do this. Uh, so this is one of the things. You're running the code uh, pretty much unchecked. So uh, you know any type of debugger checks that it might do, you're going to fall prey to those. So this is something that uh, is just kind of a, a trade-off. You're going to have to learn a little bit about these tricks and, and how to get around them. Uh, for uh, AS protect here, it's not that hard. Basically, the way it detected that we were running a debugger is uh, just 
with a simple API call. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to make the, uh, the isDebugPresent uh, plugin here tell the, uh, the API just by setting a, a variable in our PEB to tell it that there is no debugger present. And so once we do that, we'll just go through the steps again, walk through till we're at a section that's not the code segment, uh, set our break on execute, uh, and hit play. Uh, so now we are somewhere, and it looks like we're in our code section, so let's look at and see what actually we are executing. And this time we actually had to remove a, a, a bad analysis because Ollie Debug got a little bit confused about, you know, what was what. Uh, and we look here, and actually <clears throat> we're executing a return. So what's happened here is we've, we've ended up in our code section, but we're not done unpacking yet. This was just a return uh, back into the unpacking code. So now what we have to do is manually go back, uh, untoggle the remove, uh, remove the break on execute flag, uh, step back through with the uh, uh, F7 just to step one step so that we return back into, uh, we're actually on the heap now, uh, executing some code. And so now we're, we're out of that code section. We can go back to our memory map and we can set our break on execute one more time, run it and take a while and pops up and we've got another break on execute. So this is actually uh, unpacked here. Uh, once again, Ollie Debug is a little bit confused about how the uh, analysis looks. If we run the uh, analyze code here. Uh, I didn't get to a good chance to show you that that was unpacked because of Ollie Debug's uh, bad analysis there because a lot of that is ASCII in there because it's an assembly language program. It doesn't do such a good job sometimes. Uh, but that was unpacked. All right, uh, next one, uh, PE Compact. Once again, we are in the code section as we start out. We're not starting in the, in the subsection. So we're going to need to walk through uh, until we get to another section. Uh, so what happens here is it actually uses a uh, access violation exception uh, to do some of its uh, unpacking work. It's going to do some of the stuff in the uh, structured exception handler. Uh, so. All we have to do basically is step into the structured ex exception handler uh, and now we're in another section. So we're good to go. Just go back in and set our uh, break on execute and run it. And now we are back into the code when, and it, we're just going to uh, jump here. going to move our break on execute so we can jump back to more of the uh, unpacking code. Now we're going to go back in now that we're out of there and set our break on execute one more time and hit play and now it's unpacked. Once again, Ollie Debug not doing such a great job with the analysis, but you can see if you look down, uh, you don't see the, uh, the text strings from Peter, but you actually do see the, uh, the message box and exit process calls there towards the bottom. All right, so one more here, uh, T-Lock. All right, this one starts outside of the code section, so uh, looks pretty good here. Go to our memory map, set a break on execute. Uh, and we've actually landed already, and we're, but we're not in the code section. So what happened? Well, TLock is using single steps. It's using int ones for its own code, and it's kind of getting in the way of our use of the int one to tell uh, Ollie Debug when something has, has hit a break on execute. Uh, so what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to manually walk through uh, all the int1 breaks that tlock does. Uh, so we're just going to basically just keep hitting shift F9 here to keep playing until we land at one that looks like it's in our code section now. And Ollie Debug tells us it's a break on execute. 
run our analysis, and we're unpacked. All right, so that is it for the uh, video, and there's a URL you can actually uh, download the, this from, source and binaries. All right, so let's talk now a little bit about uh, ways around uh, this particular method of packing, or unpacking, sorry. So like I mentioned, anything that it's doing to try to detect that you're running on a debugger is not solved by Ollibone. Basically, Ollibone is just a shortcut to get you to the OEP, but you've got to work around these other tricks. Uh, so if they do have this code, you're unfortunately going to have to learn you know, what's up and, and figure it out. Um, other types of packers might not work anything like this. There may be, you know, no idea of a stub section or, you know, just unpacking one section at a time. It might just unpack everything to the heap and run from there. Uh, or it might uh, unpack itself a little bit at a time. So this isn't really going to help you a lot with uh, packers like that. Unfortunately, that kind of thing is a little bit harder to write, so there's not a lot of packers that actually implement it that I've seen. Uh, most of the packers that I encounter every day are like these ones in the demo there uh, and are pretty easy. Um, so in terms of evasion now, you know, once you know, all the packer authors out there uh, you know, find out that we're doing this, well, all they have to do is make their code work slightly differently and you know, now we've got a problem. So for instance, if they're not uh, running from the stub code, maybe they could run as part of the code section itself. So they're always in the code section with us, uh, making it you know, impossible for us to set that uh, type of, of break on the section. But since we're setting our, our protection per page, uh, we can break it down by 4K sections. So you know, if it came to that, we might be able to work it so that you know, only you know, the first part of the code section uh, was actually protected in the last couple of pages where you know they inserted their uh, unpacking code might not be. So it's one of those things where you just kind of have to adapt as they adapt and it just becomes kind of a cat and mouse game. Uh, there's other things, kind of bad stuff I guess that could happen. Um, we're letting this this packer pretty, uh, this unpacking code basically do whatever it wants to. You know we don't really have any control of it r while it's running. So uh, it could do sneaky things. Uh, it could send its own I/O controls to Ollibone, perhaps, and 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 make it uh, unprotect the code section. Uh, it could do other, you know, nasty things like protect, you know, parts of our kernel which we might not want protected, uh, cause us to crash. Uh, so, you know, I don't recommend you use this on production systems. This is really just kind of a, a proof of concept at this point. There's very, very little error checking in terms of uh, what the code is allowed to do. Uh, so if you feel like uh, you, know, you want to add some error protection to it and, and maybe work on the code, uh, I'd be happy to accept patches. Uh, like I said, the source code is out there. Uh, you, you, know, you really don't have any excuse to complain if, if you, know, you don't like exactly uh, you know, how it's uh, protected against these type of attacks. Uh, you should just patch it and uh, send it. Um, so there's other small tricks perhaps that could be used. Um, maybe the uh, packed code is going to affect its own memory permissions using the uh, virtual protect API. Uh, so we might have to do something like, you know, hook that API and, you know, at some point it becomes kind of a mess of trying to outdo each other's tricks. So, you know, right now what's probably going to happen is the more advanced packers are going to just make sure that it's really still hard to unpack them and, you know, the packers that are out there and have been out there that everybody uses that nobody maintains anymore probably aren't going to change and, you know, it'll probably be a while before, uh, you know, you, you, you'd see it be pretty much impossible to use this trick. Um, I do want to say that uh, after I wrote this, uh, you know, program and started talking about it, uh, somebody actually took me aside and said, hey, by the way, you're not the first person to do this. I actually found out that uh, there is a private unpacker out there that's uh, you know, not well known uh, that has this feature and has had it for a while apparently. So uh, I don't want to claim to be the first to do this or anything like that. It's just uh, 
you know, my little proof of concept that I've been using, and I just wanted to share it. Uh, so you can download it. Uh, you know, everything that I've written is GPL'd. Uh, you know, on my immediate to-do list, which I'm probably not going to get to myself, which, you know, could probably use help for, uh, I would like to be able to set a uh, break on execute for more than just the sections that are uh, assigned by the PE headers. Uh, for instance, if something's uh, riding out to the heap and, and, and executing there, uh, I'd like to be able to protect that. Uh, I would also like to be able to set break on execute on DLLs. Uh, the problem and the reason that I'm not doing this already is because some of these DLLs are in shared memory. So if you go and set a break on execute on a particular you know, section in kernel 32.dll, then you know, every program on your system is going to uh, hit an end break point immediately and, and blue screen your system if you're lucky. Uh, so there's a uh, feature here called copy on write that can come into play. You can actually uh, force uh, your own copy of each page uh, of memory. Uh, so it might be possible to force a write uh, of the same byte perhaps to a particular location that's already there, forcing it to copy itself over to uh, non-shared memory and then set your break on execute. But uh, like I said, uh, past this initial proof of concept, I haven't done that. So if anybody wants to implement that, feel free. Uh, and that's all I've got uh, for the presentation. Uh, if anybody wants to ask some questions, uh, the microphone is right there. Just make sure you talk in the mic. Thank you. Hey, Joe. Hi. Uh, I assume that if you've got a packer that's mixing uh, uh, any debug checks for soft soft uh, breaks as well as hardware checkpoints, you're going to have to manually step through that first before you kick in the uh, the memory protection. For example, I've seen at least some packers that will make a, one of the kernel calls that will kill all of your hardware debug points in, inside the process you're debugging. Right. Um, so we're not really concerned with hardware breakpoints here at all. I mean, th this this is really kind of a hack on top of the kernel, so you know, if they were using hardware breakpoints, it wouldn't affect us, or if they were trying to change the, them. The, the, the segment trap isn't, doesn't count as it, a hardware breakpoint? The, the, no. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take up one of those hardware breakpoint registers at all, no. It's, it's, all, it's all implemented by our own custom page fault handler, uh, which, you know, the malware really doesn't have any way to know about unless it, you know, actually gets wise to this trick and, and tests for it uh, later on. All right, thank you. Thanks. So the, um, uh, X86, or sorry, the 64-bit uh, Intel, uh, where they now have a proper, in the AMD, where they have a proper NX bit, um, does that mean that uh, there will be some inherent protection against packers, uh, or could they just turn off uh, the use of that bit for their code segments or whatever? I haven't really played with the NX bit too much. Uh, I actually don't have a processor that has it on it. Um, I haven't gotten around to it. Um, I don't see any reason that you couldn't write the same protection using that bit instead of the whole uh, page fault handler hack. It would probably be actually a, a much more elegant solution. It just wouldn't be, you know, compatible with all processors. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's 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 basically the same idea. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>